Remember that song from the 70s? Gordon Lightfoot sang it, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, it's that haunting song that has the same guitar part all the way through the song. <clears throat> so by the time you get done, you're kind of tired of it. But the Edmund Fitzgerald was a real song, and his song, Lightfoot's song, is a tribute to the shipwreck and to the men who lost their lives on the Edmund Fitzgerald. It was a giant ore freighter. It was 729 feet in length. It was the largest carrier on the Great Lakes from 1958 until 1971. It was labeled, as he puts in the song, the pride of the American side. On November 10th, 1975, the Fitzgerald was hauling a heavy load of ore to Detroit when it ran into a severe storm. Um, the storm generated 27 to 30 foot waves with a following sea. I did not know what a following sea was, so I looked it up. And that is not a good thing when storms come. It's okay when things are gentle because it's the way that the things are following, the waves are this way. So if you're in a boat, you want to stay on the upside of the wave, and the following sea just keeps pushing you. However, in a severe storm, when the waves get high, if you don't stay on the back side of that wave and you get on the front side, then the following sea shoves you under the next wave, which is apparently what happened. During the evening hours, the ship disappeared from radar screens and apparently sank in just a matter of minutes. It now rests at the bottom of Lake Superior, broken in two, with the bow upright and the stern upside down, still loaded with its cargo aboard and all 29 EVs. It's a fact of nature that the inland waters possess a special kind of treachery. And sometimes, due to the geography, the inland waterways are more subject to violent chains of weather. Although the Sea of Galilee is only five miles wide and 13 miles long, it was notorious for quick developing and furious storms. On the east shore, there's mountains that rise quickly to a height of 2,000 feet. The sea itself is 600 people or sea level. And so what happens is when that cold air and the warm air meet, the wind comes down through the ravines of the mountain, and it's focused and it's channeled, and all of a sudden severe storms can pop up on the lake. Danger to an overloaded little fishing boat. That was the situation that was developing as the disciples set out across the Sea of Galilee. They'd all probably known men that lost their lives on that sea in just such a storm. And we pick up the story in Luke 8, 23 to 25. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and they started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon, a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. The storm stopped, and all was calm. And then he asked him, where is your faith? And the disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. Matthew and Mark's version of this incident tell us that it had been a long day of ministry for Jesus. He'd been speaking, he'd been busy all day, and so uh, they get in the boat to go across the thing, and, and as the day draws to a close, Jesus is physically exhausted. We see his humanity there, right? Remember, one of the things that Luke is trying to do is he writes, he's trying to tell Theophilus, he's trying to tell uh, Gentile Christians that they can have confidence in who Christ is, and Christ is all God, and he's all man. And so we see here the human side of him is exhausted. He goes to the stern of the boat, and he collapses into a deep sleep. And the disciples, in obedience to his command, they hoist the sail, and they begin the five-mile journey across the lake. And then very unexpectedly, and according to the Matthew account, without warning, they were in the midst of a terrible storm. One of those winds had come down, stirred the lake up, and things got scary. Matthew uses the word seismos, uh, which literally means earthquake. That's where we get seismology and, and uh, those words. That's how he describes the storm. 
I think there's some things that we can learn from this incident. I think there's some things that Luke wants us to take away. One, he's going to tell us who Jesus is today. He's going to make the point that Jesus is God, but I think he also wants us to know <clears throat> that we're going to face storms just like the disciples did. And he wants us to understand what Jesus can do in our life as a result of those storms. So that's the first thing that we learn here. We will face storms in our life. For many of us, it's easy to think good thoughts this morning. We're in a nice warm church. The heater's working this week. Some of us are tuning in from home in our toasty little uh, living rooms or offices. We didn't have to get out in the snow in the ice this morning. But you know how life is. There can be and there probably going to be darker, more difficult days than this. This year has proven that, if nothing else. This story is an example of how quickly things can change in our lives. You've ever suffered a job loss, a life-threatening disease, the loss of a family member, <clears throat> some other drastic change, then you know that world, right? That once placid lake of our life becomes a storm-tossed, angry, raging sea. When the physician comes back with a bad report, or when you're startled in the middle of the night by a late phone call, and the voice on the other side, you know, the, uh, the, the voice on the other, I can't talk and I can't play the piano today. I have no idea what synapses are connected to what. The voice on the other end says, I'm afraid I have some bad news. And then the waves begin to beat on our boat, don't they? And it feels like it's sinking. Sometimes an analysis of the storms in our life reveals that they're brought on by our own stupidity and our own sin. It's just, you made a dumb choice, you were rude, you were undisciplined, whatever, the storm that you're dealing with, it's on you. Sometimes we deal with it because somebody else has done it, and they made a bad choice. Sometimes it just seems like they happen, and we have no idea why. But no matter what storms come up in our life, we can call upon Jesus. James tells us the purpose of trials is to test and to deepen our faith. He wrote this. He said, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. He's saying the difficult times in our life come to make us stronger. Amy and I are going to the gym and trying to get in shape instead of the shape I'm in. So when we lift weights, one of the things that happens is they're heavy. And it kind of hurts. But that hurt is necessary. Because what it does is it tears the muscles in your body, and you're like, that doesn't sound good at all, right? But then they have to heal, and when they heal, they come back a little bigger and a little stronger. The trials in our life are a bit like that. They break us down, but then as we allow God to use them into work, they build us up stronger. You can't go out and run a marathon tomorrow unless you've been practicing. It takes time to build up that strength. Trials build up that strength for our faith. There's some responses that are typical during storms. The first is that we may think that we're out of God's will. If there's trouble in my life, then surely I'm not in the will of God. Maybe you thought or you've been taught that life would be smooth sailing once Jesus came into your life. And you thought with Jesus in the boat, there's not going to be any storm, no unmanageable waves, no fear. But that's just not true. It didn't take very long to read the book of Acts and realize that is not true. I do not understand how the health and wealth mindset has any credibility, how anybody believes it, how anybody can teach it, because it does not take very long reading the Old Testament or the New Testament to see that people that follow God often have trouble in their life. And the more godly you are, the more trouble it seems like you have. In fact, Paul wrote Timothy, his protege, and he said, if you want to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted. It's hard.
Sometimes, though, we look at that and we think, well, there's got to be something wrong with me if I'm going through troubles. I must not be faithful enough. I must not have enough faith. <clears throat> but Jesus doesn't teach that. Nor does he promise that life will be a bed of roses. Even when believers follow Christ's bidding, they face hardships. The disciples were doing what Jesus asked them to do. And yet they were pounded by a terrible storm, and they seemed to be in danger of drowning. A storm with Jesus on board. It seems like a contradiction. Wouldn't his presence ensure a peaceful journey? Not at all. You can find a storm and be right in the center of God's will. Yeah. The disciples did notice that they were in the midst of the storm, not because they disobeyed, but because they had obeyed. Needless fears overcame the disciples because they didn't trust Jesus' words. If they had just stopped for a minute, they would have remembered that he had said in verse 23, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. He didn't say, let us go to the middle of the lake and drown. They had no need to fear when they were with him. They were obeying him, and he revealed his intention to be on the other side of the lake. Jesus had a plan. Even though the disciples had no way of knowing it during those terrible moments, that storm was a divinely appointed vehicle to teach them about God and his power in their lives. Without difficulties, without trials, without stresses or even failures, we would never grow to be what the Lord wants us to become. Without adversity, we would be insufferably proud, self-centered, one-dimensional, and empty. Faith must be tested before it can be trusted. Let me draw you something. I hope people at home can see this and try to get a big enough marker. Sometimes we get to a situation and we think, I miss God's will. How in the world did I end up in this mess? I was at point A. This is a mountain in the middle. I was at point A, right? And I was sure God called me to point E or B. But I get to point B and there's all sorts of trouble. I can tell you several times in my life where I'm like, how did I, God, I thought this is where you wanted me to be. Fire, there you go, thanks. My technical advisor. And I get to point C and I go, ah, well, this is where I should have been. This is good here. You know what? There's a mountain in the way from A to C. And sometimes God has to move me to point B because I can't even see point C from point A. And the whole time I'm over at point B, complain like, oh, God, this is so hard. What did I do? Did I, am I in trouble or whatever? Because I think this part of the plan. This storm is necessary. I've got to move you here so that later I can move you there. So don't be discouraged by trouble. Check your heart. Make sure it's not your own doing. But hang in there. God has a plan. Sometimes our response is to think that maybe God doesn't care. In Mark 4.38, where he's talking about it, he said Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. You ever know anybody that can sleep anywhere, anytime? That's my wife. <laughs> you, could, you could just, like, set a rock in the yard, and she's good. I got to have my nice little soft bed, the right pillow, and I take my pillow when we travel, because other pillows don't, don't do right. Maybe we can sleep anywhere, anytime. Jesus is asleep in a boat that's pitching around out of the storm, in a storm. Now, in just a few minutes, he's going to calm that storm with an extraordinary display of divine power. But at this moment, he's just sleeping in a weary human body. To the disciples, however, he seemed unaware or unconcerned about their plight. <laughs> Does Jesus know what's going on? Does he care? Or as Gordon Lightfoot wrote in that song about Ed, the Edmund Fitzgerald, does anybody know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? We mistakenly conclude that we are alone, that no one, not even God, knows what's happening in our lives and how we feel. Clearly, he's asleep at the wheel. He's all knowing, but somehow he's missed this one. And my life is in turmoil. 
And while these seasoned sailors were panicking, just because of the intensity of the storm, Jesus is sleeping. What do you do when Jesus is asleep on the boat? Unconcerned, detached, he was indifferent to their plight. Don't we feel that way at times? We're in the midst of a crisis of one form or another, and it seems like Jesus doesn't care. He just didn't seem to be interested or concerned with what we're going through. God never promised that our lives would be empty of pain. That they wouldn't have disappointment or they would be storm-free. Anyone who tells you otherwise is not teaching the truth of the Bible. What God, God does promise are resources to journey through the raging waters. And the fact that Jesus was right there with them in the ship, facing the same storm, or the fact is that Jesus was there on the boat with him, facing the same storm. Sometimes we react in fear rather than faith. Soaked, no doubt shivering, terrified to the core of the men, strained to keep the boat headed into the wind. They just knew that that next wave was going to be the one that sent them to the bottom. They're in a state of panic and they approached a sleeping Jesus in the stern of the boat, shouting to be heard above the wind. Faith was paralyzed by fear. Fear is like an anchor. It stops us dead in the water. They were afraid that all of them, including Jesus, would die. They were, of course, wrong. But so are we when we panic during different difficult times. In reality, the problem was not the storm around them, but the unbelief within them. They made too much of the problem and too little of God's promise. Too little of God's provision. Fear does that. It maximizes the problem and it minimizes God's provision and protection. Luke tells us that Jesus turned from rebuking the storm and he rebuked his disciples, saying, where's your faith? He's asking his disciples, why are you so fearful? And living like you have no faith. He's not rebuking them for not having any faith. He's just saying their faith is insufficient. It seems to me there's a little irony in the fact that the storm didn't disturb Jesus at all, but it was his disciples' lack of faith that disturbed Jesus. Their fear was natural, but they had allowed it to overwhelm their faith. When fear comes, we let the reasons for trust depart. We forget how God has worked in the past. We forget his promises. We forget. We let fear run our lives. So there's some things for us to remember in this school. The first is to call upon Jesus. That makes sense for a bunch of scared disciples, doesn't it? To cry out is to assume that there is a God who cares, and who not only cares, but acts. You know, the deist believe is that God just set things in motion and stepped back and let it happen. He left us to our own devices, storms at sea, sorry, there's natural laws, and, and uh, it's been established, certain climatic changes that happen, and when they converge, there's storms. Nothing can be done about it. I am glad that I serve the God of the universe who not only created everything that is, but is not limited by his own creation to how he can act. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 107, 23 through 30, some went off to sea in ships, flying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive work on the deepest seas. He spoke and the winds rose. Stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits' end. Lord, help! They cried in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and he stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness that he brought them as he brought them safely to the harbor. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Luke's making a point in telling us the story. Jesus is making a point in making it happen. This is the same God that still the seas in the Old Testament. 
Luke's saying, hey, this is God. Jesus is God. So we can call upon him in the storms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've heard this story, I'm sure, before. It's a story of how the storms of life kind of just nailed one guy in particular. Some months prior to the great Chicago fire in 1871, Horatio Spafford had invested heavily in property on the shore of Lake Michigan, and his holdings were wiped out by the Chicago fire. And then just before that, he'd experienced the death of his son. So deciding he needed a break, his family needed a break from all that stress. Uh, he and his wife and his four daughters were going to go to uh, England and be part of the revival with, with D.L. Moody and Iris Fink. Thank you. That's a character from the TV show. They were going to go help out with the evangelistic crusades. <clears throat> and so he planned this European trip for his family. And then um, in November 1873, at the last minute, he had some business developments that he had to take care of in Chicago. So he sent his wife and four daughters ahead, and he expected to follow in a few days. On November 22nd, the ship that the wife and the daughters on was struck by another ship, and it went down in 12 minutes. Several days later, the survivors landed in Wales, and Mrs. Spafford immediately killed her husband with just two words, saved alone. The daughters had gone down with the ship. Shortly thereafter, he leaves to join his wife, and on the sea near the area where he thought his daughters had drowned, he penned these words which describe both his grief and his faith. He said, when peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Not only do we need to remember to call upon Jesus, but we need to remember that faith can overcome your fears. Jesus, who is not concerned at all about the storm, the wind, the waves, the raging sea, is concerned about his frightened disciples, the one who had ventured on the boat. The storm was necessary for the spiritual development of the disciples. And so was the ensuing calm that was about to come. At their cry, he rouses himself, he rebukes the waves and the wind, and there is immediate calm. Jesus cares, but he not only cares, he acts and he saves. I want you to notice with me a couple of significant characteristics of how easily Jesus overcame the storm. First, notice that Jesus, by a word of command, brings the forces of nature into submission. He speaks, and it's done. Would we expect any less of the one who Colossians says spoke creation into being? Second, notice how effectively that it was done. There was a great calm. It didn't say that eventually the waves died down. Because then we might think, well, that storm that just was a thing. You know, it's just the normal thing. It says he spoke, and there was a great calm, like flipping a switch. A miraculous calm. It didn't just stop, or it didn't just cease. The winds gradually returned to normal. He spoke, and it was like there had been no storm. The day's disciples, they look around, and they're trying to figure out what's going on now. They're... Fear of the storm was replaced by a new fear. In the story, as it's told by Mark, he uses two different Greek words to describe the fear of the disciples. When the storm came upon them, Mark says they were afraid. But after Jesus stilled the wind and the waves, he says they feared exceedingly. They were terrified. Their fear of what Jesus had done differs both in time and intensity from what they felt as a result of the storm. What Jesus had done was even more startling than the life-threatening storm itself. The story begins with the disciples terrorized by the winds and the waves, and it ends with them terrorized by the intervention of Jesus. <laughs> they were awestruck at this new revelation of the power of their master. 
remember they haven't been with him real long. So sometimes we kind of get on them like, oh, I'll see, they didn't have much faith. Those are the two disciples. They hadn't been with him for years and years. They were still learning who he was. But let me tell you, this was a big deal. These were good Jewish boys. They had grown up and they had to learn the Old Testament. They had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. We have a hard time memorizing the verse. They knew it. They knew the story of creation. They knew that God spoke creation to being. Now they're on a boat with a guy that says, cool it. You think they began to clue in to who he was? This could be God. This could be the Son of God. A little scary. The ease with which the Lord calms the storm led them to marvel and to say to one another, Who can this be? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey. And the answer to their question, Who can this be? was answered a long time ago in the Word of God. Psalm 89, 8 through 9, O Lord, God of heaven's armies, Lord of hosts, where is there anyone as mighty as you, O Lord? You are entirely faithful. You rule the oceans. You subdue their storm-tossed waves. In the lives of the disciples, the absence of the presence of faith was revealed by the traumas that they were going through. So it is with us. Where is our faith during the storms of life? It's the crises of life which reveals our faith. It's at such times that we face a threefold challenge. Are we going to worry about it? Are we going to work? Are we going to trust? Hard times come, we can choose to worry, which we all know deep down doesn't do a thing. Except give us acid reflux, right? <laughs> when we're faced with adversity, we can try harder and harder until we see that, once again, we really don't have any control of the situation. But we can, in faith, fall before the Lord and ask for his help. Peter invites us to do that in 1 Peter 5, 7. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Listen to the news now, and it's one of the things that's an offshoot of this COVID is the increase of anxiety, mental health issues. If you know a family member that deals with it, you know that it's a real deal. But I also know that Jesus is real. When he says, cast your anxieties on me, he means it. He's big enough to carry those anxieties. And God can take those times when we are going to worry, we are going to fret over that, and he says, trust me with him. And so it can be an opportunity for you to grow in your faith. Faith does not exist without the option of fear. The problem becomes when fear squelches our faith and we stop obeying, we stop acting, we stop trusting. If there was not the opportunity for fear, there wouldn't be the opportunity to trust it. So we can look at those things as an opportunity for us to grow, an opportunity for us to see God in action, an opportunity to learn to rest in him. Jesus longs for us to put our trust in him. He's the only one who can take us through the storm, not around the storm, not over it, not under it, but through the storm. So whatever your problems may be, be still and listen for God's voice. Jesus spoke and he commanded the winds to cease. And I believe that Jesus will speak to our problems if we will sit still long enough and listen. People say, well, God doesn't care about me. He doesn't care that I'm going through such a hard time. He just doesn't care. The Bible tells us different. He does care. And he hears. And he is on the boat. Let's pray.